from the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. Alaska is big. The state spans an area as wide as the distance from California to Florida, and much of the terrain is wild and inhospitable. Alaska has 39 mountain ranges, 12,000 rivers, 100,000 glaciers, and 3 million lakes. Much of the state is heavily forested, while boggy tundra covers other areas. In some regions, mudflats along the coast act like quicksand, entrapping a hapless interloper so tightly he can do nothing but watch the tide rise until he drowns. Avalanches and mudslides are common in the winter, and residents expect floods in the spring. If you want to disappear, Alaska is the place to go. On February 24, 2004, 35-year-old Richard Thomas Hills, known as Rick, left his home in Soldotna, Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula to drive 150 miles to Anchorage to pick up his paycheck from the oil company that employed him. Officials at the company confirmed he picked up his check, but he was never seen again by his family and friends. Two days later, his red Dodge truck was found plowed into a snowbank 15 miles from his home. The keys were still in the ignition. Rick's driver's license rested on the front seat, and troopers found $292 in the center console of the cab. The troopers found tracks they assumed belonged to Rick leading from the truck through the snow into the woods. The man who left the tracks was dragging his right foot, and he hobbled for more than a quarter of a mile to an abandoned airstrip where the tracks mysteriously stopped, as if a spaceship had beamed him aboard. Rick's mother, Dolly, and his longtime girlfriend, Heidi, stated Rick would never have committed suicide. He loved his three children, and he even invited the kids to join him for the drive to Anchorage. But since the kids all had plans for the day, none of them were able to accompany him. Heidi admitted Rick had a wild streak and sometimes took drugs and drank too much. But for the most part, his hard, partying days were behind him. His mother insisted that even when Rick became too impaired to drive, he always called his family to let them know he was okay. He never disappeared for days. Both Dolly and Heidi were convinced Rick had been a victim of foul play. The Alaska State Troopers' search for Rick ended after a few days when they found no trace of him, and it was left to Dolly and Heidi to keep the case alive. The two women penned up missing person posters with Rick's photo all over the Kenai Peninsula. They talked to Rick's friends and convinced snow machiners and pilots to repeatedly scour the area near where Rick's truck had been found. Dolly even consulted a psychic, who told her Rick had frozen to death, and two men had been near him when he died. The psychic told Dolly that Rick's remains would not be recovered for 10 years. In August 2005, 17 months after the disappearance of Rick Hills, Jane and Leroy Potter drove to their 39-year-old nephew's trailer to check on him. Their nephew, Richard Bennett, was a loner who lived near the Kenai River, only half a mile from where Rick Hill's red Dodge truck had been found in the snowbank. Although Richard liked to keep to himself, Jane and Leroy hadn't seen him in several months, and they were beginning to worry about him. Richard was an auto body repairman, but he had struggled to find work on the Kenai Peninsula. When Jane and Leroy arrived at his trailer, they found it was cleared out. 
the Potters called Richard's father Leon, and the next day Leon traveled to Alaska from his home in Bremerton, Washington. Leon, Jane, and Leroy searched Richard's property and found his belongings in a shed near the trailer. Most of Richard's possessions had been sorted into rubber-made bins and labeled with the name of a relative or friend. He'd signed over the titles of his two pickup trucks to his Aunt Jane, and she admitted it looked as if her nephew had gotten his affairs in order, and she feared he had committed suicide. Jane noticed, though, that his camping gear, including his tent, sleeping bag, and some of his guns were not among his possessions in the shed. Had Richard taken off into the sprawling wilderness of the Kenai Peninsula to subsist? It certainly would not be out of the character for him to do just that. Richard's father, aunt, and uncle began questioning neighbors and residents of the nearby town of Sterling and learned no one had seen Richard in several months, and he had withdrawn his last $10 from the bank in late May. Richard's nearest neighbors, the Cuffles, said Richard had come to their house in March or April to use their fax machine to send out job applications and had seemed depressed and discouraged about finding work. In mid-May, the Cuffles saw Richard burning a large amount of garbage at his place, and although it hadn't meant much to them at the time, they now recalled seeing a great deal of bird activity in the woods near Richard's trailer in June. Increased bird activity usually signals an area where an animal has died and the birds are feasting on the carcass. The Cuffles had assumed the birds were eating a down moose or caribou. But now that they knew Richard was missing they began to worry about what had drawn the birds to that spot. The morning after talking to the Cuffles, Leon, Jane, and Leroy hiked into the woods near Richard's trailer and began a careful search. Four hours later, Jane came upon a human skeleton minus a head. She called to the two men, and the three of them examined the skeleton. The first thing Jane noticed was that the skeleton was wearing Levi's over his blue sweats, and Richard always wore blue sweats under his Levi's. Leon, Jane, and Leroy felt certain the skeleton in the woods was their Richard, and the Alaska State Troopers agreed with them. The troopers sent a bone sample to a Texas lab for DNA testing, but the lab told them the results would not be available for 18 months. Richard's family wanted to bury him before then and asked the troopers to release his remains. The troopers were initially reluctant to declare the skeleton was Richard Bennett until they received the DNA results. But when two forensic anthropologists compared Richard Bennett's x-rays from a local hospital to those of the skeleton, they noted the two right leg fractures on the x-rays matched those on the skeleton. Several years earlier, Richard had fractured his shin and calf bones in a motorcycle accident. The x-ray evidence convinced the troopers the remains belonged to Richard Bennett, and they released the skeleton to the family. The family had the bones cremated and buried the ashes on a hillside overlooking Lower Summit Lake, a place where Richard liked to hunt. Richard Bennett's memorial service was held on June 23, 2006. Let me take a short break. My latest novel, Massacre at Bear Creek Lodge, is now available everywhere online. Here's a teaser summary. Alaska State Trooper Sergeant Dan Patterson flies to a remote area of Kodiak Island to investigate the massacre of eight people at a small lodge, and he encounters the worst murder scene he has ever investigated. How did someone kill eight individuals in the middle of the wilderness and then disappear? Patterson takes a hard look at those closest to the lodge owners. Did Brian or Deb Bartlett murder their parents and the six guests at the lodge? Was the killer the neighbor who lived a few miles away or someone else in this sparsely populated bay? Each time Patterson picks up a new lead, evidence shifts the course of the investigation. 
Meanwhile, the killer strikes again, murdering one of Patterson's main suspects. And Patterson knows he must stop the monster before more people die. Fast forward nearly eight years to the spring of 2014, when a huge wildfire broke out in the western lowlands of the Kenai Peninsula. The blaze burned 200,000 acres near the towns of Sterling and Soldatna. The fire started where the Funny River Horse Trail intersects the Funny River Road and was named the Funny River Fire. While battling the fire, firefighters found bones in a burned area, but thought they were the bones of a moose, caribou, bear, or some other animal. It wasn't until they uncovered a human skull that they realized the nearby bones might be human. They called the Alaska State Troopers, and Lieutenant Cat Shuey began investigating the case. Shuey requested a list of people who had disappeared in recent years near the area where the bones had been found. And Rick Hills and Rick Bennett's names topped the list. Both men had disappeared about three miles from where the skeleton had been discovered. When Lieutenant Shuey began cross-checking files with the state medical examiner's office, she became confused. According to the records, Richard Bennett's remains had been found and released to his family several years earlier. Why was his name still on the missing persons list? Shuey dug out Bennett's original file and was shocked to find a letter dated November 5, 2007, from the University of North Texas, stating the DNA results showed the skeleton found in the woods near Richard Bennett's trailer was not Richard Bennett. The letter apparently had been filed away by a clerk without anyone ever informing Richard Bennett's family of the DNA results. The Alaska State Troopers did not begin filing the records electronically until 2012, so the findings had never been cross-referenced. Shuey wondered if the bones found in the Funny River Fire belonged to Richard Bennett, and perhaps those released to the Bennetts belonged to Rick Hills. While this result would not excuse the mistake made by the troopers, Shuey felt it might make the situation easier for the Bennett and Hills families to accept. Shuey ordered more DNA tests, but this time she asked for the test to be expedited. She refrained from telling the Bennett and Hills families anything until she had the DNA results in hand. She wanted to have scientific proof before she made a bad situation even worse. When the results came back, things became even more muddled. The Funny River Bones belonged to neither Richard Bennett nor Rick Hills, but the remains released to the Bennett family in 2006 did belong to Rick Hills. Shuey and her fellow troopers now had the grim task of informing the Hills and Bennett families of the terrible mistake. Rick Hills' girlfriend Heidi and his mother Dolly had been searching for Rick for 10 years, and now they were told his remains had been found a little over a year after he disappeared. Dolly recalled that the psychic had correctly predicted she would not find Rick for 10 years. The Bennett family believed they had buried Richard years earlier and were beginning to move on with their lives. The news that they had buried someone other than their son, and their son was still out there, felt like a punch in the gut. Richard's mother, Betty, was in the final stages of a terminal lung disease, and her husband, Leon, decided not to tell her that their son was still missing. Instead, Leon watched his wife die with the added burdens of knowing he was keeping a secret from her and wondering what had happened to Richard. If he had known Richard was still missing, he could have spent the intervening years since Richard's disappearance searching for him. Richard's Aunt Jane remembered that they never found Richard's camping gear and guns. Was he still out there somewhere living off the land? While a subsistence lifestyle is not easy, it is possible in Alaska. Alaska. 
the Hills and Bennett families met to discuss the situation and the loss of their two Richards. When Leon, Jane, and Leroy found the skeleton in the woods, they were certain it was Richard because it was dressed in Levi's over blue sweatpants. When the forensic anthropologist told them the person found in the woods had once broken his right leg in two places, the finding confirmed the identification in their minds. Now they learn from Dolly and Heidi that Rick Hills and Richard Bennett had been nearly the same height and age, and Rick Hills also often wore blue sweatpants under his Levi's. Perhaps the biggest coincidence, though, was that Rick Hills also had fractured his right leg in two places. He'd suffered his broken leg while playing hockey. When Dolly and Heidi learned he had been dragging his right leg when he walked from his truck into the woods when he disappeared, they believed he had re-entered the leg. The striking similarities between the two men and the proximity to where they disappeared led troopers and Richard Bennett's family to make a leap of logic to the mistaken and unfortunate conclusion that the skeleton they found in the woods was Richard Bennett. In July 2016, authorities finally identified the Funny River Bones. They belonged to Soldotna resident James Allen Beaver, who had been missing since 2011. Rick Hills and James Beaver had gone to school together, and Richard Bennett had lived only a few miles from Hills and Beaver. It's difficult to believe that three local men could walk into the woods near their homes and simply vanish for years. But if locals with their knowledge of the terrain, environment, and wild animals can disappear so easily, we can understand how so many visitors to Alaska vanish without a trace. Rick Hills' skull has never been found, and Richard Bennett is still listed as missing. Was foul play involved in the disappearances of Rick Hills, Richard Bennett, or James Beaver? we will likely never know the answer to that question. People mysteriously disappear in the Alaska wilderness all the time. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. You can also search for this podcast on Patreon to learn more about the Last Frontier Club. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Thank you.